Well, my name is Greg Burchard. I'm the archaeologist here at Mount Rainier National Park. I also coordinate Indian relations with the park. We're standing here in Ohana Pakash Campground at the southeast corner of Mount Rainier National Park, in which we've got an archaeological site that I think is of some importance to the park. So we've got about 110 archaeological properties documented all around the mountain, dating to as early as 9,000 years ago. So we've got the, this is a site map of, a working site map of Ohana Pakash Campground, southeast corner of Mount Rainier National Park. In 2014, we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do archaeological testing in advance of the new utility line route that was, that was replacing an older one that's about 40 or 50 years old, is aging. In advance of that route, we were excavated constant volume samples, the system we call constant volume sampling, which essentially uses a special incurved handle post hole digger that allows us to dig 30 centimeter diameter holes at a consistent diameter, perfectly nice cylinders, down to about a meter and a half. Along that route, everywhere you see a red dot on this map, around, through, along the road line, around the road issues, we see the campground road loops and into the campground facilities, restroom areas, power boxes, things like that. This, by the way, is the Ohana Pakash River, and these are the camp, various campground loops in the, in the campground. In the process of doing that, we located our first four low elevation archaeological sites, pre-contact archaeological sites ever recorded on Mount Rainier. So finding four sites intact, in situ, at a low elevation place where none had ever been documented before, nor was there any indication of a presence here on the surface at that time, was a big deal. And so working off of that, that success from last year, the park has authorized us to sample the landscape now more broadly to see if the pattern that we observed and the utility lines is general to the landscape as a whole. So what we did in that process was set up a grid system. Everywhere there's a cross, it was an excavation point where we did constant volume sampling. And in the process of doing that, isolated a series of about 20 more positive units that had chipstone tool remains at varying depths. The one reason that this works is that tool stone, tool, stone tools for piercing and cutting and scraping work well. It makes a fine, sharp edge. The problem is, is they break a lot. It's very fragile, it's brittle, so, in, so for us that's handy because in the process of repairing and refurbishing these tools, which has to be done daily, people in the past generate a rain or a deposit of this chipstone tool remains where they've been repaired. And even though the tools themselves are saved and taken away, we, they still leave behind enough of the repair material that we can identify where people sat in the past that did these things. So what we do then in these samples is sampling system is to uh, separate the intact set, the, the in situ sediments from toolstone materials. These are cherts and obsidians, things like that. So here at this um, area of the site, what we um, initially did is we opened up a, that little constant volume sample in the corner. And when that turned out to be positive, um, after doing several others in the area, we decided to expand on that area. So first we excavated a one meter by one meter square unit, um, which Corey is standing in at this time. Um, and we had pretty good results from that. Um, the recovery pretty much matched what we had found in the constant volume sample. And we also recovered uh, one tool from there. We also noticed as we excavated that the, um, the stratigraphic layers, the layers of different ash balls that have built up over time to form this, this campground, um, were fairly intact, had not been disturbed too much by the forest that's grown up here over the last thousands of years. And so that made us really um, want to expand on that unit because the less disturbance we have, the better idea we have of, of exactly where in that profile of um, different ash layers that the artifacts are coming from. And we have a better chance of finding them kind of where they were dropped at that time. So what I'm doing now is I'm just uh, skimming a real thin amount of dirt off of the test unit at a time. And uh, we skim just really small amounts so that hopefully we can find artifacts in place and then that gives us more information as to the time frame that they came from. So um, after I skim the dirt off, we, uh, we bucket it and go sift the dirt in the screening area over there. and. Um, and then anything that's found in the screen is bagged for this particular level that we're in. And we're, trying, we're testing a number of the, of the locations across the Ohana Pakash area in which we had positive results. And so this is another test unit.
lakes that we found today. And then some, sometimes we, we collect rocks that kind of look like they might be flakes and we can look at those more closely later. So and we're getting maybe about uh, like 12 to 20 flakes per level. What happened was right above that Mount Mumazama ash, we found um, a diagnostic artifact, a temporarily diagnostic artifact, which was um, pretty exciting. <laughs> so this is what would have been the base of a spear or dart sized point. And a similar one was found at an archeological site not far from here. And then this is about where it would fit on that complete point. So it's just the base, the hefting element of the point. This style of point is generally associated with earlier occupations in, in this area. And finding this point style helps us kind of more firmly establish that this is an early site. All of these points are from a fairly early site that was excavated nearby, probably with an age range somewhere between 7,300 and 7,900 years old. So right now, our working interpretation is, is that, that folks moved seasonally up into high elevation landscapes along various routes into Mount Rainier, with this being one of them, having, making short-term stops along the river on their way up uh, to higher elevation ground where, where folks were seasonally gathering resources of use to them. Huckleberries, uh, marmots, mountain beaver, glacier lily, elk, mountain goats, mountain goats perhaps foremost of all things that aren't available in low elevation landscapes and bringing them back. The modern, the modern representatives of people who have been in this area for a very long period of time are still here. They have different names. They have names that were applied by treaties, but they include such groups around Mount Rainier as the Nisqually Indian tribe, the Puyallup tribe of Indians, the Muckleshoot Indian tribe, the Confederated tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation, the Cowlitz Indian tribe, Squaxin Island Indian tribe, and others that reside in this vicinity that were signatories to various treaties, and some didn't sign treaties, but those folks are still here. And their ancestors were here before them, and this make folks aware, I hope this helps make people aware, that Native American people aren't just an artifact of, of the last 200 years, or of the treaties, that they have a past that goes on for a very long period of time, and that they use landscapes like Mount Rainier through much of that period of time for at least 9,000 years.